This podcast is intended for investment professionals only. Hello and welcome to this episode of Market Talk for the month of November, where we'll be dissecting Jay Powell's latest words on the likely path of US interest rates and asking what's behind the relatively lower oil price. We'll also be feeling our way through a maze of US and Chinese economic data, as well as commenting on the upcoming China-US summit in San Francisco being held later today. So asking the questions is me, Frances Watson, here in the UK, and newly returned from a few days away, Ben Bennett, who joins us from Hong Kong. Ben, how are you? How was the break? Where did you go? I'm very well, thank you. Now, definitely. Uh, I was in Koh Samoy, so Thailand, and uh, yeah, pretty uh, pretty nice weather, pretty nice time. Can you get sick of Thai food? I think this is a sure way of rapidly losing listeners, Ben, as we're all <laughs> super jealous here in the freezing UK. Should, should we move swiftly on? Yeah, let's. <laughs> Um, so look, lots of excitement, not just about your holiday, but in bond and equity markets as well this week. Of course, we're recording this hot off the heels of those US CPI numbers, which were rather good. Yeah, well, good in the sense that they were a little bit lower than expected. So, yeah, the path to a soft landing for the US, which is the the way that you know next year will look much better for investments in general. So that path requires inflation to fall. That's one of the things that it requires, and and it also requires the U.S. to avoid a recession in order to get to get uh, inflation to fall. So we need to see the two things: we need to see U.S. growth remaining okay, and we need to see inflation gradually fall. So it, inflation in the U.S. was a little bit lower than expected. I mean, it wasn't a huge miss in terms of lower than expected. So the core. Um, inflation was about it was four point naught percent year on year, and that it was expected to be four point one percent, and and it was four point one percent last month. So it it sort of clipped off naught point one percent. So the market reaction to that was actually in in one day. So one day is is you can't really extrapolate it, but it's pretty euphoric. You know, equities mm, were up a lot, mm. bond yields were down for basically what was a naught point one percent fall, and we've got to get that core inflation down to about two and a half percent before it hits roughly where the Fed is happy with it. So there's a fair few 0.1 percent left to go. Inflation is also pretty erratic. So I guess what I'm, I'm saying that we haven't got there yet. I'm also saying that I think the market reaction seemed to be a little bit excessive. Maybe there's, there's other stuff going on, of course, but that seemed to be the major catalyst yesterday. And the other thing is on the growth side, uh, we have started to see some deterioration in the labour market, not nowhere near recessionary sort of uh, alarm bells, of course. Today's data, which everyone will have seen when they listen to this, will be important. That's retail sales. The consumer in the, in the US has been very strong. Retail sales have been very good. So we'll see if that continues. But a little bit circular, though, you know, if, if we start to see unemployment tick up, because of you know that these high yields squeezing the U.S. companies and they start to shed employees, then presumably you'll also see retail sales disappoint a bit because you know people will be unemployed, have a little bit less money, all that sort of stuff. So it's still, I'd say, a narrow tightrope to soft landing, but it was it was a step in the right direction. So that's that's why we had a bit of a, a positive reaction from markets. How is that guiding then, Jay Powell's? hand because yeah. as you say about this circular argument narrative yeah. you know we've had tighter lending conditions from the um october slo the senior loan yeah. um officer, officer survey, survey yeah. and then of course we had softer economic data but that in yeah. itself you know bonds rally you know less monetary well, tightening so how does that yeah that's work? that's right so, so so yeah i mean you've sort of you sort of categorized the, the issue there so basically jay powell in the last meeting so that was on the first of november he came up and he said right we're pausing hikes so this is the second meeting that they they've uh, they paused rate hikes one of the reasons why he said he's going to pause is what you said there that financial conditions have tightened and they've tightened since the last meeting um so the senior loan officer survey which is the banks they said that they're tightening uh, you mentioned yields yes they've gone they went up as well actually since the last meeting it's quite interesting since the 20th of september so that's the previous meeting to the 1st of november which is the latest one 10-year bond yields went up about half a percent and you know that's one of the things that the 
Fed is looking at, Jay Powell's looking at, but, you know, if bond yields have gone up half percent and I haven't tightened interest rates, then in effect, mm. the market is doing the job, my job for me. The problem is that the reaction since the meeting, since that 1st of November up until the close of yesterday, which is the 14th of November, those bond yields fell 50 basis points because investors said, well, you know, Jay Powell is being less hawkish. So yeah. maybe he's not going to hike interest rates as much. So then yields come down. Uh, but if Jay Powell was doing the same meeting today, he'd be looking at yields a lot lower, wouldn't he? So he wouldn't be quite so yeah, comfortable. Yeah, so we've got that, extraordinary that have done volatility. The job. Yeah. 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 So again, that's another reason why I said the job isn't done yet. Uh, that that you know, we, maybe we got the inflation data that was okay yesterday, but we need, we still need to squeeze more of it out. And if the market suddenly reacts in a euphoric way and it continues to go that way, then Jay Powell will be nervous that. They're not doing enough to get that inflation down. For example, since the meeting on the 1st of November, again, up until yesterday, the S&P is up like 7%. So mm. again, mm. That's, mm. Jay, Jay Powell will be nervous about that reaction. Yeah. You don't want yeah. it to be, I mean, that's obviously too, that's, that's a, a very unique two-week period to be up by quite so much. But he'll be a bit nervous that, that we've had such a big reaction. Okay, so you mentioned Jay Powell being nervous there then, Ben. In terms of our current thinking and with regards to equities and bonds, are we getting a bit nervous too then? So, I mean, if you remember, our our view is how I've articulated there that the it's very difficult to get a soft landing. And therefore, we have generally been underweight equities. We've generally been underweight credit. And okay, that's that's not been the right trade over the last couple of weeks, of course, because you know the S and P's rally, credit spreads have tightened. But we also quite like duration, so that's 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 done okay over the last couple of weeks because interest rates have have come down. But we like duration because we think that ultimately in a recession you're going to start to see you, you'll see interest rates being cut. Jay Powell will cut interest rates when he sees inflation comes down because infl- because because there's a, there's a recession going on. But we are still underweight equities we still think you know, at these higher levels over the last couple of weeks we're even more nervous that the market's got ahead of itself credit we are also underweight but not, not quite as negative on credit markets as on the s p on well on, on general equity markets because mm-hmm. credit fundamentals particularly yeah corporates that we look at we we think would be able to ride out a, a a, a sort of not, not a particularly bad recession, but a shallow recession, be able to ride that out. I think credit markets, whereas the S and P could have a more nasty reaction to such a recession because earnings would would come down presumably. You know, there's a lot of talk in the market, isn't there, about the US soft landing, and I feel other parts have been slightly neglected. I mean, Europe, for example, um, yeah. while some areas of Europe are flatlining in terms of growth, Germany's having a tough time of it. And what are the implications there for? Eurozone equities, yeah. then. Yeah, that's right. So, I mean, Europe as a whole sort of flattish, GDP flat, flattish. Uh, but Germany does seem to be doing worse than average. And some bits of Europe are doing a bit better. But I think Germany has links to the global manufacturing cycle, which we know has been weak. Uh, links to China, perhaps as well, stronger than in other countries. So, industrial production has been weak in Germany. German unemployment has gone up from 5% to nearly 6%. You know, that's. You start to get mm. nervous. If, and mm. the problem with, with the recession, I mentioned before, that as long as it's a shallow recession in the US, we're all OK. When you're in the recession, when you start to see unemployment going up, you don't know how deep it's going to get. You don't know at which point it's going to turn. So at the minute, the German recession is shallow, but who knows? that's assuming yeah. it stops and gets better fairly soon. And in terms of soft and hard landings, um, well, what's the oil price? Uh, telling us at these levels, 80-something dollars a barrel now? Oil's been really funny. Uh, it's something I, I sit next to our energy credit analyst here in uh, Hong Kong. I did actually ask him today so to try and explain this to me because a few weeks ago, oil was going up, even though we we're a bit worried about recession. We are worried about high interest rates squeezing uh, economies. Oil was going up basically because of production cuts from OPEC plus Russia and, and Saudi Arabia. And now... Even though we're getting a bit more optimistic about growth, oil has started to come down again and doesn't make a lot of sense. But I think there's been a little bit more production than expected from the the shale producers in the US. We're getting some positive signs out of Venezuela, possibly. 
uh, some embargoes being dropped there. Uh, maybe Iran could be brought back to the table. And also, actually, demand has been weaker than expected. Uh, U.S. demand for petrol, for gasoline, a little bit weaker than expected. Maybe that was just the high prices that were uh, eroding some of that demand. People just drove a little bit less because it was costing too much money. But anyway, it's come down. And that's quite a positive reaction because we're worried about inflation. So oil coming down is positive in terms of it will decrease inflation. So that is definitely a positive for markets uh, over the last few weeks. Let's look ahead to what we've got coming up on the agenda. And a big focus of attention today, as we record, and it's Wednesday, is the meeting of Joe Biden and Xi Jinping um, at the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Forum, if I've got that right, in San Francisco. I think this is their only second in-person meeting as leaders. The rest have been virtual. But what what can we expect then face to face? This has been the accumulation of many bilateral meetings between U.S. officials and their equivalents in China over the last few months. I mean, we've spoken about it. And it's always had this San Francisco summit as a focus, as hopefully that there'll there'll be a face-to-face meeting. And it does, yeah. Yeah, Well, he's landed, hasn't he? And it's it's a a positive in the sense that uh, that hopefully they'll agree to some uh, resumption of military-to-military communications, which was put on hold after they that ridiculous balloon situation uh, a little while ago. So that would be good. Maybe we'll see a few uh, policies, uh, some smaller policies agreed to. I saw there was a headline in Bloomberg talking about potentially China starting again buying Boeings, for example, having frozen that after the 737 MAX problems. And also there's quite a few CEOs that have been invited to meet Xi Jinping as well. So which I think that's always that's always really important. Elgium CEO was here in uh, in Asia just last week, and just meeting people and talking to people, having a focus on the region, just just gets you a better feeling for how things are going, and maybe we'll get better investment. You know, China has been a real weak spot. Spoke about Germany just just now, but China also has been a weak spot. It'd be good to have a little bit more positive feeling for that. Maybe a bit more investment, and that could help the global economy, couldn't it? So geopolitically, great. And also maybe from a global economic point of view, that could be a benefit too. Okay. We've also got a raft of company results. Um, Mainly, if I I can crudely group them, we've got uh, China Tech, we've got US retail. We've had, as you say, US retail numbers. We've got China out, I think, as well. There's so many, I can't keep up. Where do you want to start? <laughs> yeah, so that's right. So yeah, the US retail sales is out today. So will, yeah, as you say, it will be out by the time people listen to this. And, you know, some of the big retailers um, are coming out. I think Home Depot already announced yesterday. We've got Walmart. We've got Target uh, tomorrow. That'll be Thursday, I think, if I'm getting my days right. So, yeah, that, this, this is really important for the U.S. consumer just to keep going and keep spending. Uh, so we, we'll get lots of information there. But m- most of the U.S. Q3 earnings are out now. Uh, this, we just got a few at the end, right, uh, to, to come. And S&P 500 earnings are up 6.2% uh, compared more, to last year. More than year. expected, so that's good. isn't it? More than yeah, expected. it's always more than expected. I don't know why people expect it to be less than what it always is. You know, it's uh, a bit of a confusing okay. one. It's, all, it's, all, it's always more than expected by a few percent. Uh, but that's because companies are very clever at keeping expectations yeah. down and then beating. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's what's going to happen. I do think next year that earnings expectations are a bit too high. Even if we get a soft landing, uh, most the, the sort of forward-looking analyst expectations for earnings per share are continued growth. But I, under a soft landing, you're going to have to see GDP slow down. Otherwise, you're not landing. No. So, it's, so you still need yeah. it to slow down. And if GDP slows a bit, it's hard for that, that earnings per share to keep going up quite so much as, as it is expected. And under a hard landing, under my scenario of a recession, you could see some serious negative uh, shocks, and then China, yeah. So we got we got Alibaba, we got Tencent, uh, JD.com. So a lot of the technology companies, a couple of them have already announced quite a focus on that. And you know, remember, a lot of these big technology companies in China have underperformed their equivalents in the US. So we'll see what the fundamentals look like in the next couple of days. And that, is that presumably because of the progress on? artificial intelligence or, or the lack of is that is that why us done better than china tech i don't yeah i mean there are a 
clearly, if, if you look at some of the massive uh, performances by by some of the huge companies in the US, they've done really well. Maybe the Chinese counterparts have lagged a bit, but it's still the same sector. There still should be some opportunities there. I think it's been the the negative China sentiment and the overall negative China macro performance that's weighed on those companies. So if that turns around, and we're talking about what's going on in San Francisco, you know, maybe that maybe there's a turnaround for some of those uh, for some of those big sectors in China as well. Very interesting. All right. Well, we've talked through quite a few numbers, but of course, what we haven't talked about is your number of the month. So what is it, Ben, and why have you chosen it? I've chosen $11.7 trillion to be exact, which is funny funny enough, we were just talking about some of the big US companies. That $11.7 trillion is the market cap of the Magnificent Seven, which I think most people can... uh, can name now those those seven stocks in the US that have just done incredibly well. You're not going to test me, are you? No, exactly. No, I actually, I, 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 uh, <laughs> I can name sure, three. Sure. <laughs> oh, there we go. Let's see if, uh, if, if, if all our listeners can can name them. We'll, we'll, we'll give them the answer <laughs> next time. No, the um, that's eleven point seven trillion. But it's so huge that number. It's just it's just worth just reiterating how big that is. It's something like thirty percent of the S and P five hundred. But the S&P 500 is huge, of course. And if you look at U.S. investment grade corporate bonds, so it's a sector that I look at a lot, sort of just been most of my career. That's only six trillion, six point two trillion dollars. So the Magnificent Seven are double the size of the entire U.S. investment grade corporate bond yeah. market. The U.S. high yield corporate bond market, again, something we talk a lot about, is one point two trillion dollars in size. So these Magnificent Seven are ten times. Just those seven names are ten times the size of the U.S. high yield corporate bond market. So maybe we should spend a bit less time talking about bonds and just talk about those seven names. Yeah, it's phenomenal, isn't it? But I suppose what what it shows as well is the expectation riding on these companies to deliver future earnings, and and yeah. that's you know that that's uh, potentially worrying. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, look, um, we'll leave it there, Ben. Um, Thank you so much, as always, for um, for your thoughts. Good to see you back from Holes. Um, of course, the next time we'll, we'll be talking, I think, is early December, isn't it? Where we'll be taking a bit of a longer look, a look back at the year and looking forward to, uh, to what we can expect in 2024. But for now, Ben, thanks as always. And thank you all for listening. Thank you. As a reminder, this podcast is intended for investment professionals only and shouldn't be shared with a non-professional audience. This podcast should not be taken as an invitation to deal in legal and general investments. Any views expressed during this recording belong to the individuals and are based on market conditions at the time of the recording and do not reflect the views of legal and general investment management. Forward-looking statements are, by their nature, subject to significant risks and uncertainties and are based on internal forecasts and assumptions and should not be relied upon. Where individual stocks are mentioned, these do not constitute a recommendation to buy or sell any security and are for illustrative purposes only. Legal and General Investment Management Limited is authorised and regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority. For full terms and conditions, please visit our website. To find more content, you can check us out on Twitter, LinkedIn and our website. Copyright 2023. Legal and General Investment Management Limited. All rights reserved. No part of this publication may be reproduced or transmitted in any form or by any means, including photocopying and recording without the written permission of the publishers. This material is issued by Legal and General Investment Management, Asia Limited, the Licensed Corporation BBB 488, regulated by the Hong Kong Securities and Futures Commission, for professional investors only.